All right. Um, this is it so far, which is a bummer because I'm going to tell you things that are really, really valuable here. Um, so, um, so I keep getting questions from people about um, a few aspects of manipulating the reservation file. So I want to pin that down um, once and for all here. Um, so, so I'm getting questions about how to um, <coughs> how to find a name in the reservation file, how to add to the reservation file, and how to remove a record from the reservation file. Uh, you oh, you can just imagine what I'm writing. <laughs> yeah, actually. All right, so how do we find a name in the file? How do we add to the file? How do we remove from the file? Um, so let, let me uh, make some code to, to do this. So, so here's a reservation file. Um, and Izod has a reservation in there. Um, but it's not for five years from now. So, um, All right, so uh, if you want to add a record to the reservation file, right? So let's say name equals Nick um, from equals here, um, date equals now. Um, so you can do something like this. And, and let me... Do you read the strong line archives? I don't. Oh. But somebody did. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we can we can echo you know whatever variables you're creating to store the destination city, the the uh, departure city, and the dates, and so on. Right? You can echo those and say greater than greater than reservation.txt, and it'll add a new record on the bottom. You know, with that information. So. Um, Adding to the reservation file is pretty straightforward. Just, you know, echo stuff greater than greater than res.txt. Um, in some cases, people are asking how to figure out if a name is contained in the reservation file. For example, maybe you want to say, I notice you already have a reservation. Would you like to, you know, keep it or change it, for example? So let's say name equals Izod. Um, if we grep for dollar sign name in res.txt, it'll pull out any record that that contains that string and it'll show it to us. Um, but after you do grep, there's this status variable, dollar sign question mark, which gets updated. Right? This shows you the result of the previous command. And if you search for something with grep and it finds it, it will set the status variable to zero. Okay, and and we can throw the output of grep into dev null, right? Um, and this dollar sign question still gets set up. So dollar sign question um, zero means that it's found, and one means not found. So if I said name equal to Mickey Mouse, and then I search for Mickey Mouse, and I check dollar sign question mark, the one tells me Mickey Mouse does not have a reservation. So you're branching at zero. Yeah. Or, or one. Oh, yeah. Depends what you want to do. All right, so you can use that to look for a reservation. The real thing you need to do ultimately, though, is if somebody has a reservation, you're going, going to make a new reservation for them, you need to remove that old reservation. Okay? Um, and the easiest way to do that is with grep. So let's go back to Nick. So I can search for dollar sign name in reservation.txt. Um, So first of all, right, somebody named someone was traveling from a city called Nick to a city called there. I don't want to remove their reservation. 
because their name is someone. This first passenger, whose name is your name here, is traveling to a city called Nick. I don't want to remove their reservation. So you want to be a little more specific in how we search for a reservation with a given name. In particular, I'm going to do this. Because the name is the first field, I'm going to use an anchor. Say, let's look for beginning of the line, followed by this name, followed by a comma. And if I do that, it's only going to find a record where the name in the first field is Nick. Okay, so grep has a switch we can use. We can say grep-v. That reverses the behavior of grep. It will only show me lines that don't contain that pattern. So if I do grep-v, that's basically what I'd like my file to look like with Nick's reservation removed from it. So I can do something like this, grep dash v caret dollar sign name comma res dot txt and then let's just save that in you know a new res dot txt so there's the original reservation file Here's the new reservation file. And it looks just like the original, but we removed that record that we wanted to get rid of. And then you can just do something like rename that new reservation to the old. Now when I look at res.txt, I removed Nick from it. So that's that's one pretty straightforward way to get rid of, of reservations for people you've already processed. Make sense? Yes, no, maybe. Yes, maybe. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> All right, let's talk about awk. Awk is a wonderful tool. Um, SED is, is a good tool for reading in lines of input from a file and doing something line by line. AUK is really good for reading lines from a file and then doing things with the individual columns in that file, the individual fields. Um, like here's a foods file, right? And maybe I want to do something like uh, print this out, but not bother printing the color of the food. I just want the first, second, and fourth columns, but not the third. And I could do something like this. Or this. Right? And I've said print out columns one, two, and four. And it suppressed column three. So awk, we're, we're initially going to be thinking about um, actions we're performing that have something to do with the columns of each record, right? The fields on a given record. Um, and so, so the general structure of our program is, of our awk statement is awk program and then input file. And just like said, if our program is, is complex, we can say dash f, and we can have a program file name. And it'll read the program from that file. And fields are separated by spaces.
Right. And and when I read this first line, apple, fruit, red, cheap, the first field's going to be apple, the second field's going to be fruit. If there's one space, if there's a hundred spaces, it does not matter. Okay, just like in command line processing, if you run a command and you type your first thing and you put in a bunch of spaces and you put in your second thing, your second argument is just the thing after all those spaces, right? So um, if I run that same awk program, right, I don't see all those spaces. They're just separating one field from another. And if I don't have spaces between my fields, if I have, you know, commas between my fields, then when I read this first line, that entire first line is dollar sign one. And dollar sign two will be empty because there's nothing after the space. So that's just going to print out the original. But if I want to use some delimiter other than a space, I can say dash uppercase F and some character and that character will be the field delimiter. So I can say dash F comma, and now it does what we wanted it to do. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, good question. Oh, um, I've got all these extra commas in here. There we go. All right, so normal delimiter is space, but you can change it to whatever you want. All right, so our program is lines uh, that look like this, basically pattern, and then curly bracket action. And the pattern can be various things. We'll just go through some examples of it. Um, but there's also special patterns, begin and end. Begin is a pattern that matches before you start to read from the file. And end is a pattern that matches when you're finished reading from the file. So you can do sort of initialization and post-run and deinitialization using those patterns. Um, we have variables. We have dollar sign one, dollar sign two, and so on. Those are the fields. We also have a special variable dollar sign zero, which means the collection of all fields. This works in bash, too, for command line arguments. Dollar zero is a set of all arguments. Um, we can also do things like nf, which is the number of fields, nr, which is the record number, and a few other things. So let's look at some programs. So here's program one. Um, it has a pattern. It has an instruction at the top. The pattern is begin. So this instruction will match before we begin to read from the input file. And the action it says to take is to print out two number signs and then um, name type color cost. And then on the second line, print out some underscore. So it's printing a heading. Okay. And then the next line of our program says no pattern. So this will happen every time we read a line of input and says print NR, which is the record number, and then a space and then dollar sign zero, which is the whole input line. And then there's a third instruction which matches the pattern end. So when it is done reading input, it will print out total number of records, colon, and it will print out NR, which was the last record number that it read. 
So I can say awk-ff1 that says use program f1. And let's run this on the foods file. And you get output that basically has a header on it and then shows you the contents of the file with a number in the beginning of each row. And then at the end, there's a message that says total number of records, 17. <coughs> so that's just some, some processing. So I can do something like this, awk, quote, print dollar one, dollar two, dollar three, dollar four. That's you just print the first four fields on every line, and I get that. So print doesn't automatically put in spaces. I can put some spaces in like that. But you can also use commas. commas will throw a space in between each field. And if I just want the first three fields in a different order, right, that's easy to do. So, so really quick to manipulate um, pieces of an input line, right? All right, patterns, we can do things like if the length of field one is less than or equal to five. So this will read line by line, and for each one, it'll look at the first field and say if its length is less than or equal to five, take this action, which says print out um, the entire line. So now it's just giving us things where the name of the food is five characters or fewer. This is going to get exciting really fast, so stick with me. And I'm definitely going to put this on the exam for the people who weren't here today. So. <laughs> um, so, so a pattern can also be a pair of conditions separated by a comma, and it basically says when that first condition is satisfied, we're matching. And when the second condition is, condition is satisfied, after that, we're not matching anymore. And then if later on that first condition is satisfied again, it will start matching, and when the second one is fired, it'll stop matching, and so on. But the easiest way to use this is just say number of record equals three, number of record equals six. So this will basically, for all lines between three and six, print out the record number, or colon, and then the original input line. So if I just do awk ff4, I get records 3, 4, 5, and 6. All right, another thing we can do with patterns is we can say something like dollar sign 4 tilde slash regular expression. And we can put that in an if statement. Okay, this tilde means we're not looking for equality. We're looking to see if this regular expression matches this thing on the left. So we could specify a reg x and say if, if field 4 matches that reg x, then take some action. Um, So for example, if field four matches the pattern cheap, then we'll change four to say under $2. Otherwise, we'll change field four to say over $2. And then without any pattern required, we'll just go ahead and say um, print zero. Sorry, that's not a pattern. That's just an if statement. Um, so if we run this, Right, we basically change that last field to something different based on a conditional.
All right, we can also have variables. And kind of like in Bash, we don't need to declare variable types. So if I just use the word cheap equals zero, it's going to infer that cheap is a variable and it should hold a number. And it'll initialize it to zero and expensive gets initialized to zero. And then I have um, a pattern, dollar sign for tilde slash cheap. So if that fourth field contains the string cheap, then I'll increment the value of cheap. And if it contains the word spendy, I'll increment the value of expensive. And then there's a final set of instructions that correspond to the end pattern, which says after you're done processing, print out the value of cheap and expensive. And awk understands printf in the style of C, so you can use percents to format your output. And so I'll print out cheap foods, percent D is cheap, and expensive foods with new lines on the end, and so on and so forth. All right, so I can run that, and I get a synopsis of the cost of the food in the file. Okay, so all of that is well and good. Um, but it's not the most exciting thing in the world. But this is. Um, so let's talk about associative arrays. So, so, I always mention this story for what it's worth. Um, when I first encountered associated, when I first encountered arrays, which was like when I was first learning programming um, in the 70s, um, arrays kind of blew my mind, right? There was something magic about them. When I encountered associative arrays in the 80s, that totally changed my life, okay? Um, in programming, it became my hammer, right? So if if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Everything looked to me like something that I could use an associative array on. Every problem that I had in programming, for about a year or two after I encountered this, anything I wanted to do, I'm like, I can use an associative array for that, right? It's a big sledgehammer, it's very overpowered, but you can do a lot of stuff with it. So I'll give you an example of some of the things we can do with this. In a moment in awk, because awk understands these types of arrays. But what is an associative array? So imagine in C you say integer data bracket 10. Okay, data is a reference to a bunch of values, right? And we access these values by saying data bracket 0 or data bracket 1 or maybe data bracket 9. Or if we're really crazy, data bracket i, where i is an integer bigger than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 9. And that's cool by itself, right? But imagine if we did not have to limit ourselves to just using integers between 0 and 9 to access elements of this array. Imagine if we could access data bracket 2,413 without having to declare ahead of time that this holds 2,400 and some elements. Or we could say data bracket negative 17 or data bracket pi or data bracket ha ha. Imagine if we could use anything we wanted as an index on this array. Yeah, embrace it. <laughs> if you can do this, you can do a totally different kind of programming. So for example, um, suppose you're trying to create a, a set of data that stores student grades. So how would we do this in, in C? We'd um, you know, have car name and you know, 120 students and each one has 30 characters in their name and we'd have, let's just do numeric grades. So we have integer grades 120 
And if I want to store a grade for Nick, you know, I do something like string copy name bracket zero Nick. And then I'd say grade bracket zero equals, I don't know, I'll give myself a 75. Right? And I could do something like this to store other grades. And now I want to know, um, what did Izad get in this course? Well, how do I do that? Well, I do something like if string compare name bracket i quote Izad equals zero. And I put this in some kind of for loop. Right. And I say, if that thing's name is equal to Izad, then, you know, print grade bracket i. So we iterate over these things, right? So that, that's, that's doable. But imagine if we could do this instead. We could make an array called grades. And we could say element nick is 75 and element Izad is 95. I think he was a good student. And grade slacker is, is 90 because slackers are good at coding. Um, and so on, right? And now if I want to know what did Nick get, right, I can just say print grades bracket Nick. And I don't have to do all of this stuff and loop and string compares and all that kind of stuff, right? My data is stored by name. Okay. It's associative because associated with this key is this piece of data. Associated with that key is that piece of data. And there's, there's good support to the idea that this is somehow related to how our memories work and possibly to how our brains work in general, how we conceptualize. Because we don't just, you know, iterate through a big long array of, you know, concepts and, and pull out something that matches, right? We, we make these leaps from one thing to another. You see a problem and you think, oh yeah, I remember something about F equals MA in there, you know? And, and you start running down that and it's like, oh yeah, we got to draw some vectors and they've got to be, oh yeah, and there's cosines somewhere in there, right? And, and if you're data is stored like this, right, we can, we can even do something like, you know, data bracket key, and that might bring up another key, which we could use to index that same chunk of data, which we could use to index that same chunk, right, and we can follow these paths and so on. It's a very, very powerful kind of natural way to code information. It's very different from what we usually do. Um, so I, I wrote a lot of compilers when I was a kid. Um, and, and you need to like keep track of variables, right? So your language says, you know, integer x, float y, uh, character z, right? So you make an associative array called variable type. And variable type bracket i has the word int stored in it. And variable type bracket z has the word car stored in it. And you want to know where these things are stored in memory, so you have another array called variable location. And you figure out where you're going to store x, and you store that in variable location bracket x. And then when you get to an instruction that says x++, plus plus, you find the location by looking at variable location bracket x, and you just say increment file register that location. And you write that into your assembly language translation. So, so these, these are good things to know. Um, and awk understands associative arrays. And we're going to work with associative arrays. We're going to build associative arrays in 222. They're also called hash tables. And we'll, we'll play around a lot with hash tables in 222 um, and somewhat in 223. But they're built in to awk. So here's a cool little script. So it's has one line of action, which is foods bracket dollar sign two plus plus. And then there's one thing that happens at the end that matches the end pattern. So let's, um, 
let's just read in a bit of our file just to play with. So, um, food bracket dollar sign to plus plus. It's an 11 character statement. What does it do? Um, Awk will read the first line of the file. That's this line right here. And dollar sign two is the word fruit. So this instruction really says foods bracket fruit plus plus. It says to increment an element of the array indexed by the word fruit. Okay, so what does foods look like inside the brain of Awk? Well, initially it's an empty array. Since we're talking about an element indexed by fruit, it needs to have an element indexed by fruit. So it creates that and it initializes it to zero. And now we're saying take that element and increment it. So foods bracket fruit is now equal to one. Okay, it reads the second line of the file. Dollar sign two is fruit. So it again executes foods bracket fruit plus plus. Well, foods bracket fruit is one, increment that, now it's a two. Read the next line of the file. Dollar sign two is cookie. So now it's saying foods bracket cookie plus plus. Well, there is no element cookie, so it creates one. Initializes it to zero, says plus plus, that becomes a one. Reads the fourth line, dollar sign two is fruit, so it says foods bracket fruit plus plus. That's a two, so it increments it to three. And then it reads the next line, and dollar sign two is drink. So that first statement says foods bracket drink plus plus, and there's no drink, so it creates one. Initializes it to zero, increments it. So what's happening as it's running? It's basically building an array of how many times each type of food appears in our input. And it'll do this over the entire set of input. Until it's done with input, and then this pattern end matches, and it executes this one instruction. Well, this is a for loop. And it's a different type of for loop. It says for food type in foods. And then there's something to do inside that loop, which is a printf statement. Okay, this is slightly different from a for i equals zero, i less than ten, i plus plus. But the same, the same general intention. Um, if we have an array of integers, if we have just data zero through nine, we can go through that data very easily for i equals zero, i less than ten, i plus plus, do something with data bracket i. We can do that because we know our indices start at zero and they're consecutive and they end after nine. But we don't know that we have an element called fruit or an element called cookie or an element called drink. We don't know what those are ahead of time. So how do we iterate over this? So we use a different type of for statement called a for uh, variable in. So what happens when you execute this, this for loop? Basically, it will look at the different indices that have been used for this array, and there's three of them, and it will set food type equal to one of them. And it might not be the first one. The order is effectively random. But it might say, okay, food type is drink. And then it will do whatever's in the body of the for loop. And then when it comes back up here, it will set food type to a different index. So maybe it'll set it to fruit and it'll execute the body of the loop, and then it'll come back up and it'll set it to a different index. Well, it's done drink and it's done fruit, so it would set it to cookie, and it'll execute the body of the for loop. And then it'll come back here and it'll say, I've already assigned it to all the different types of indices that I know about, so the for loop exits. So it's an example of something we'll call an iterator in, in winter term, um, but it's a way to loop over all of these different indices. Okay, what does this for loop do? It's a single print statement. It says print number of percent %s colon percent %d. What gets printed for the percent %s? The value of food type. So that should be cookie, fruit, drink. And then for the percent %d, it prints out the value of the array indexed by that food type. That should be the count 
of the number of times that food occurs. So if I do that, I get my nice index of how many times each type of food occurs. This would randomly create that list, right? So it wouldn't just be number of feet at the top every single time? So it may be, but if I did it with a different thing, it might be different. Yeah, it's a little, it's unpredictable okay. what, what the order is, but it, it's probably the same from run to run. Um, but if I fed the input in a different order, it would be something different. Suppose I want to count how many times each color of food appears. Change one character. Exact same program, but index it off of field three, which was the color. Right. Okay, so intuition says if you can, can change from one behavior to another by changing one character in your program, you got something pretty, pretty funky going on. So, um, were you have food types there? You mm -hmm. said that it just uh, kind of guesses and then... It, it, it picks something at random. <laughs> right. Can you, instead of uh, just setting in food type, can you set food type to be that column? Like, Which column? Uh, column two. Um, so this end thing is happening after we're done reading input from the file. Right. Right, so we don't really have a column two at that point. Right, okay. But um, I mean, you could earlier on in the loop. Okay. Right, food type is just a variable. Yeah. Right, it's not magic. It could be any variable. So um, if you wanted to put in another for loop for printing the color, mm -hmm. how, would you, how would it know to distinguish between one and the other? So I could do something like this. I could do something like that. And now I'm tallying based on each of those fields. Cool. Yeah. All right, this is almost the same code. The action item is count bracket dollar sign item plus plus. But, um, I'm inside a for loop now, and my for loop says for item equals one, item less than or equal to nf. nf is the number of fields on an input line. So if there's five things on the line, it's a loop for i equals one, two, three, four, five. And what does it do in that loop? Well, if item is equal to one, this says counts bracket dollar sign one plus plus. When item is two, it says counts bracket dollar sign two plus plus. So it's really doing this, right, um, it's using the same array instead of separate arrays, but it's doing it for dollar one, dollar two, dollar three, dollar four, dollar all the way through the end of the last field on that input line, and then going out of the next line, and so on. So, what is this doing? This is counting the number of times that each word occurs in your file. And then when you're done with your input, we iterate over all the things in count, all the indices, which are all the words that we found, and it prints out um, the value of, of that element in the array counts, so that's the number of times it occurs, followed by the word itself. So there's some, some text I pulled off the web, it's just a news story. And if I run that through my, my IND script, it gives me a word count. And if I sort that numerically, right, I can see the most common word was the, followed by a, uh, followed by a, uh, and so on. Yeah. So for the assignment, 
let's say that somebody enters in their name and does a capital because they know grammar. Mm -hmm. um, if they enter it in again, but without a capital, is that a different person? Or is it's that up to you. Okay. Yeah. Depends on, on what country and planet and galaxy your That's reservation right. system works in. Um, and grep, remember you can do grep dash i to ignore a case. Oh, right. So if you want to pick up, or you can convert everything to uppercase before you save it. Different ways to do that. So yeah, dealer's choice. All right, here's a script called index. This is the same as the previous one, but I changed the shebang in the beginning. Normally we say bin slash bash, and that means if I just type the word index, <coughs> you should run this code through bin bash. Well, I changed it to, to be user bin awk, which means if I just type the word index, it will run this code through user bin awk with the dash F switch to read from this file. So what have I got here? I've got an index utility. I can say index text and it runs this on the text file. I can say index war and peace and it does it on war and peace. And I can do a sort numerically and there's a word count of all of war and peace. And that's all it takes. Basically three lines of code. Can we done this for uh, PA4? If you can go back in time. <laughs> So PA4, right, we had some extra things we wanted to do. Well, there's a utility called TR. It's transliterate. Um, what does that mean? It means if you see a lowercase a, replace it with an uppercase a. If you see a lowercase b, replace it with an uppercase b. So if I do this, and I read from war and peace, that makes everything uppercase. And if I pipe it into sad and I say replace a left parenthesis with nothing, that will get rid of left parentheses. And if I say substitute a double quote with nothing, it should get rid of these double quotes, like in that next to the last one, right? And so I can do my pre-processing. Oh, I have to do it globally. So I can do all my pre-processing that we had to do in super duper get car, get rid of the quotes and the dashes and the parentheses, right? And then um, pipe that into index and sort that. So 34,000 occurrences of the. Um, and how would we deal with phrases instead of words? Um, well, we know that phrases end with things like periods and semicolons and so on. We could change each of those phrase enders into, say, a number sign or something we don't expect to see in here. And then we could use the same awk program where we could say dash uppercase F number sign. And now the fields would be things separated by number signs, which would be our phrases. And this would, you know, give us a count of phrases. Um, And then we could add another line in awk that prints out the length of each line. So print the length of dollar sign zero and print that out in the beginning. And then we could sort based on that. And that would sort our phrases by length. And then we could take all of that and put it into awk and just print out the second and third fields and get rid of that length. So you could turn this into a pretty close rendition of PA4. And it's you know a three-line awk program and then some some commands that you pipe together. All right, so so punchline here, right? Bash is is a powerful environment. Unix is a powerful environment to work in. Um, Bash is is goofy in its syntax sometimes, and it's it's sometimes the realm of you know bored six-year-olds. But we can do a lot in there, right? We can put commands together and sock. Uh, said and awk um, are, are powerful tools to have available um, and don't underestimate how much you can do with those. We can also do things like um, just write little programs, right? So here's an awk program called S1 
It has a single instruction which matches the pattern begin, so this runs before it reads anything. And it's a for loop from 0 to 10, just print out the value of x. And I can just do awk-fs1. I don't even have to give it anything to read because there's no actions to take on input. Um, and it runs my for loop. Here's a program S2. It initializes a running sum to zero, loops through the first 10 integers and adds them to the running sum and then prints out the sum at the end. And I can run that and there's the sum of the first 10 integers. Here's a pretty standard prime number tester. So A goes from three through a thousand by twos and this inner loop tries to divide A by odd numbers. And if the division ever results in zero, I set this composite flag to one. And then after the loop, if composite is still zero, I print out that number with a percent D and a space, and then put out a new line at the end. So if I run this, I get a list of primes from three through a thousand. And I'm not doing any file processing. I have nothing in here that mentions fields on input lines or anything like that. But it's, it's a handy programming environment. It's, it's more natural than bash, right? It's got if statements and for statements and no double brackets that we have to deal with. We don't have to declare variables and so on. It looks more like C, um, but it's a little easier to go. We don't have to compile and so on and so forth. So awk is a really good sort of does a lot of things kind of tool. Um, so it's good, it's good to play with and get familiar with. All right, so that's, um, that's my deal on awk. Um, tomorrow we will start looking at some system programming concepts. We'll start looking at processes, um, finding information about processes. We'll talk about how processes are created, different ways to control them, and we'll build up from there. And we'll be doing system programming kind of things for the next few days, um, probably through next week, which is a short week. All right, that's all I got. I will see you next time.